Before the days of GPS in our cars, do you remember those days? Some of you grew up on them, so like you don't you don't remember except maybe your parents driving. We used to look for signs that told us where to go. Now we still do that somewhat. Like when you're coming, you're traveling down the internet, you want to know what's at this exit. You know, uh, your GPS will probably tell you that if you look for it. But there'll be like rest or uh, uh, food or lodging or gas or and sometimes. Like in our family, when we're traveling, we're always looking for bathrooms. So we want to know if if there's available uh, places to stop. But I'll tell you what you don't do at times like that. You don't stop at the signs. It'd be like stupid to say lodging ahead and then pull over, park in front of the lodging ahead sign and take a nap. Go to sleep for the night. It'd be like, or, you know, food and, and oh, yeah, let's go to Chick-fil-A or McDonald's. and Oh, let's stop at the sign. I'm like, where's all the food? So we, those are the kind of things we don't do uh, about signs. Uh, signs are important, but signs are not the end game, right? We understand that. We understand that on the highway. And we're going to see that in the passage of Scripture that we're going to begin to unpack this morning in John chapter 6. John, uh, one of those guys that was real close to Jesus for three years, uh, followed Jesus everywhere he went, came to believe in him, and then stopped to believe in him when Jesus died and thought, man, it's over. All of our hopes and dreams have died. And then third day later, man, boom, Jesus rises from the dead, and, and John is reinvigorated, and he ends up writing uh, the Revelation. He writes First John, Second John, Third John, those three little letters in the back of our New Testament, and he writes the gospel according to John. So what we have is an eyewitness account. I mean, we are as close to the actual events as you can get because we have an eyewitness account. And, and John is recording these things to us. And, and John really talks about seven signs. He gives us seven of them. And today we're going to talk about one of those. We're going to see that. And it's the feeding of a mass group of people, sometimes just simply called the feeding of the 5,000. Although what we're going to see is that Matthew says, well, there were women and children there too. So we're easily talking about a much larger crowd. But John calls them signs because a sign, although it's important, a sign is not the end game. A sign points towards something else. And the something else is more important than the sign. Would you agree with that? If you're looking for lodging, the lodging is more important than the sign that says lodging ahead. So the sign points us to something that is more important. But what we're going to see is uh, people were fascinated by the signs and weren't looking at what the sign was pointing to. And Jesus calls them out. Jesus was not out to build a big crowd. He was out to build a committed crowd. And we're going to see that. And and John chapter 6 is a rather lengthy uh, chapter. And it's going to take us a few weeks. And so we're just going to begin with that today. And here's what we're going to see over the next couple of weeks as we delve into John chapter 6. These people, they, I'm calling them they, wanted a political king, but not a personal king. They wanted a, we're going to see at the end of uh, uh, the 15th verse that we're going to stop at today that they wanted to come and take Jesus by force and make him a king because he had just gave them enough food to eat. They wanted a political king, but not a personal king. So let's read. I'm going to read John 6, 1 through 15. It'll be up on the screens. If you have a copy of your scriptures that you want to look at and follow along, that's great. I'll be reading from the NIV. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, as it was sometimes called. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples, and the Jewish Passover festival was near. So when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. 
And when another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. And when they had all uh, had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So we'll kind of look at this first uh, in, in a couple of major headings. First of all, the crowd, this crowd of people. And it says that uh, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed. And, and this was near the Jewish Passover festival. Jewish Passover was the biggest, if not one of the biggest festivals, feasts, uh, religious celebrations to the Jewish people. And people f- flocked to Jerusalem. So it's a good chance that a lot of people are coming The Sea of Galilee is in the northern part of Israel, and they're coming down a pathway along that side of the Sea of Galilee, and and, and so they're headed to Jerusalem, but they're also seeing the signs. Now, John records seven overall, but Jesus did a lot more. In fact, John tells us at the end of his gospel, if everything that had been written that Jesus ever did, then... The world couldn't contain the volumes. So what we get is a small sampling. Uh, Some researchers said we get about 30 days out of all four Gospels of the life of Jesus. 30. And, And so there was just, his miracles were unattested. They were unquestioned. They were well known. Sometimes they accused Jesus of getting his power from the devil, Beelzebub, and, and uh, but there was no question that they were happening uh, in the record of that day. So they're, uh, they're, they're along the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a, is a beautiful. If you look at it today, I, I pulled up a picture. Sea of Galilee is actually the lowest uh, freshwater inland body of water in the world. So it's about 700 feet below sea level on average, 700 feet. The lowest body of inland water is salt, and it's the Dead Sea also in Israel. So what you've got is it's kind of like this little depression, and and so there's mountains all around it, which kind of probably explains at times why we read the disciples are in, in a boat, and they're out in the middle of the lake, and there's these squalls that come up because this wind just coming down off the mountains. And uh, we'll read about that in a, in a week or two because that's what happened next in John 6. So there's this crowd of people, and they're interested in Jesus, sort of. And it says they're following Jesus, but we have to add a sort of, sort of. You would think Jesus would be, and we're going to find out more about this later, and if you read the rest of the chapter, you'll easily see it. You think Jesus would be excited to be like the pastor that says, man, we got a full house today. Jesus wasn't interested in full houses. He's interested in full commitments. And that's that's something we're going to see that gets uh, unfolded as we go through this. Uh, They were interested in signs, not the identity of the one to whom the signs pointed. Uh, We're going to see this. They were far more concerned about food for their stomach than food for their soul. Reminds me, Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And, And so the question that, that really any serious considerer of following Jesus, any serious follower or somebody who's thinking about becoming a follower of Jesus is, what's more important to me, food for my belly or food for my soul? Food for my belly or food for my soul? Which one do I spend more of my energy really, whether time aside, really seeking after? So there's the crowd. And then there's the test. Uh, I don't know why Jesus looked at Philip 
and said, you know, I'm doing this, which recorded here, John tells us to test Philip. Let's look at these verses again. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples, and the Jewish Passover festival was near, and Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, now there's 12 of these guys, and he said, we have no idea why he said this to Philip, and not Andrew, and not Peter, and not Matthew, and not Levi, and not... Uh, Judas or not one or the other. You know, why, why did he pick? Well, we, we have no idea. So we're just going to have to leave that as an unanswered question. But he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And then John adds this. He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. So Jesus already knew. Philip? And I kind of always think, whenever I read this, I think Philip says, why are you asking me this? You know, like, And so he responds with, you know what, we, we, we don't have enough money to buy enough food. He could have said, there's nowhere to buy food for this crowd of people. I mean, there was no Walmarts, Costco's, no large. I mean, you ever seen a bakery in a small village? I've seen them in the Philippines. It's usually just somebody's house. But they have an extra window on the side of their house. And they would sell bread. Uh, sometimes there's an actual like little shop. But it is like what we learned in the Philippines uh, was it's the same kind of bread just in different shapes. It's, it's pretty much. Uh, and there's, sometimes there's some sugar sprinkled on it or not. Uh, but all the, all the bakeries that we ran into in the Philippines were pretty much like that. And, and this is, you know, like, this, that, that's what we're talking about. There's, there's no place to go. There's not enough money to buy them. And in, in Matthew's account of this, in Matthew, I think it's 14, he, the, the disciples say, Jesus, you need to send the people away so they can go find enough food to eat because they've been with us all day long. So where should we buy bread? And Philip answered, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And then, and I don't know why, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, why, why, would, he, why would he say, hey, there's this young lad over here Picture the crowd, 20,000 people. And Andrew says, there's a little boy over here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. It's like, Peter, are you, uh, Andrew, are you trying to be the teacher's pet here? Are you, I mean, what, what are you? Is, is, is like, I can just imagine Peter looking at his brother and going, Andrew, like, duh. I don't know. I don't know what those responses were, uh, but Andrew... Uh, anyway, Jesus uses those five barley loaves and the two loaves of fish. So, But here's the test. We don't know why Jesus asked this specifically of Philip. I think it really was a test of all of them. It really was a test to all of them. So we think about, what is the purpose of a test? What is the purpose of a test? Think of a test in school. A test really motivates... And illuminates. You think about it. A test motivates and illuminates. Suppose there was a teacher who said in class one day, whether it's middle school, high school, college, whatever, the teacher says, okay, I want you to read the first two chapters of the textbook, but there's only going to be a test on the first chapter. How many people are going to read the second chapter? Now, I know my wife would for sure. And I know when I was in school, I would have thought, nope, not going to be tested on that. No sense in reading that, right? And so a test motivates. When we know we're going to be tested, it, it motivates us to prepare. And ideally in school, that's to learn, right? It's to learn. Now, we, sometimes in school we lose sight of that. <laughs> it's, it's like, no, the motivation is to pass the test, you know, regurgitate the information and then forget it as soon as as you're done, right? You know, like, uh, like so, so often in school, the motivation is, is not to learn, it's just to pass the test, you know? And the teachers want to pass the proficiency tests, and, and, and learning does take place. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not knocking the educational system at all. I'm just thinking, maybe personally for me, what was my motivation? Pass the test. Don't want to have to take it again, right? You know, do well enough to get by. So there's some degree of motivation. But a test also illuminates. 
Once you take the test, it illuminates either how well you did or how well you didn't, or somewhere in between, right? It illuminates, it reveals information that really you still need to know or could know. And, and I got to thinking how many people after, you know, they take a test and they got an 80%, I know this is true for me, how, did I ever go back and look over that 20% that I didn't get right to learn it? No, right? It's like, no, it, okay, it illuminated it, but the, I'm just, I know there are people, if you're not, maybe, maybe I'm the only person like that in the world that just is like, just glad to get it over with and, you know, do well enough. And, uh, but it illuminates, it either illuminates how well you did, how well prepared you were, or what you still need to learn, right? So a test motivates and illuminates, and that's true for this test. That's true for this test. And it's true for the tests that God gives us. Did you know that God tests us? God tests you. And he may test you in ways that you're aware of. He may test you in ways uh, that you're not aware of. Um, So I got to thinking about this. God tested Abraham. Genesis 22.1 tells us by telling him to offer his only son Isaac as a as an offering, and of course, God didn't want him to follow through with that. But Abraham's test was this, do you love your son more than you love me? God tested Job, it tells us, in Job 23.10. And it's kind of like what Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than you love these? Job, am I more important to you than everything and anything else? Uh, Israel, uh, it tells us in Isaiah 48.10 that God tests us in the furnace of affliction. Problems that come your way can be a test. Can be a test. Is it going to motivate and, or illuminate or both? Tests in the furnace of affliction. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 3.8 that Israel as a nation went through a time of testing in the wilderness. In the wilderness refers to the 40 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness because God took them out of Egypt. His intent was to take them right into the promised land. But when they got on the edge of the promised land, there was a couple people that said, yeah, we can do this. And a couple of people said, or the rest of the people said, No, there's giants in the land. There's too many problems. It's too big for us. Let's go back to Egypt. And so uh, God had them wander for 40 years so that every person, I think it was above 20 years age or older, every person except for two out of that entire group of over a million people died off before they went in. The rest of the team went in to the land. And God tested them. So here, here was the nature of the tests. Now keep, keep in mind, keep this keep in mind. This is a group of people who just saw the 10 plagues. Now you, you've seen them on TV too, right? You, you've seen those. The 10 plagues come on Egypt and you've seen that they saw this parting of the Red Sea, right? There's this pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day that is leading them. And wherever the cloud or the, the pillars stopped, that's where they would camp. And sometimes when they're camped, they're looking around and they're saying, there's no water. And instead of, now, instead of thinking, hmm, God brought us this far. I wonder what he's going to do about this. It's like, oh, there's no water. Let's go back to Egypt. And then God would give them water. And then there'd be somewhere and another, another place and it's dry because that wilderness was barren and There's no water. And instead of going, hey, last time we were in this exact same scenario. Do you know what God did? Man, Moses spoke to a rock and water came out of it and boom. Or that time, remember the time when there was bitter water? It was poisoned and we couldn't couldn't drink it. And God told Moses to throw a stick into it and God purified the water. No, every, every every time they came up against a new affliction, a new problem. Yeah, they griped and complained and said, let's go back to Egypt, where they were enslaved. But at least they had food and water every night before they went to bed. They preferred that rather than living a life of faith. 
over and over and over. And then, then in Hebrews, we get a commentary. In Hebrews chapter 3, which tells us that it was a time of testing, it says this in verse 9 of Hebrews 3, For 40 years they saw what I did. They saw the signs. They saw what I did. And I didn't mention the manna. You know, that happened every day. You know, so and there's, the, there's the water, there's the manna, there's the provision. Miraculous things happened that they saw. They didn't just hear about. They saw. They saw what God did. And in verse Hebrews 3.10 it says, But they have not known my ways. What does that mean? To know somebody's ways. When you know somebody pretty well, you're likely to know what they're likely to do in a given situation, right? Sometimes you can look at somebody you know really well and say, I know what you're thinking. Or if they're not around. I wonder what? I wonder what my spouse, I wonder what my wife, I wonder what my husband would do. I know them so well, I know in this situation, this is probably what they would say. This is probably what they would do. You know, you know, when you know somebody well, you begin to know their ways. Do you know what that's telling us? These people saw what God did, but they didn't really know God. They were immersed in Moses. They were immersed in, in God. They saw these miraculous things, but they didn't really know God. They saw what he did, but they didn't know his ways. So let's go back to Philip. So here's, here's the test. Philip, you've seen what I've done. But let's see if you can uh, apply. Now, we've never been in this situation before. Now, there's another time that Jesus feeds a crowd of 4,000 people, but that happens chronologically later. So we've, got, we've never been in this scenario before, Philip. It's kind of like, what do you think I'm likely to do? Can you apply what you've learned in the past about me to this new scenario? So let me ask you that. You've seen God work in your life in the past, probably. I hope so, right? Do, 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 do you apply the previous learning to your current scenario? Or does it still create anxiety and fear and worry and fretting? You know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And oh, oh, God, why did you? There's the griping. And just think of what, what do you do? Ask yourself that question. Are you really learning and growing because of what you've seen and experienced of God in the past? Or are you still stuck in the same patterns of fear and anger and depression? What are you learning? How are you growing? Are you applying what you've experienced of God, of Christ in the past? So back to Israel. Time after time, they faced an obstacle or a problem and and had a need. And what did they do? They did not apply last week's learned experience to this week's problems. And so they were stuck. And to be honest with you, I've been a pastor for over 40 years. A lot of Christians, I'm going to say most most that I've seen in churches are stuck in that same kind of pattern. Are you learning, let me ask you this, are you learning God's ways? Are you learning his ways? Are you getting to know Jesus better? And when you get to know him better, you're more likely to know what he's going to do next. Are you growing? Can you see growth markers in your life? Can you look back a year ago, two years ago, six months ago, five years ago, and can you say, I definitely have seen how I've grown in my faith. I definitely know God better. I'm definitely handling problems differently. It may not be perfectly. <laughs> Let's just throw perfection out the door here. But it's, it's, it's better. It's different. I don't get as angry. I don't get as frustrated. I don't. I'm checking my, I'm learning. I'm growing because God is helping me and he's helping me to grow. Or am I just stuck? And if you're stuck, can I speak rather directly here today? I'm going to anyway. If you're stuck, it's your fault, 
nobody else's. It's not mom or dad's, husband, wife, pastor. It's not anybody else's problem or fault. It really, it really isn't. Growth is an opportunity that we need to intentionally. Every pastor would love, every elder, every discipleship group leader, every home group leader would love for the people that they have influence over to come to them and say, help me learn how to grow. So what about us? Faith Outpost Church. Do you know we're on the verge of a test? Biggest one we faced since two years ago when we were deciding to stay together as a church and forming teams and doing all that stuff that has helped us to get to this point. And you know, we chose not just Outpost Church, we chose Faith Outpost Church for a reason. More than just because we wanted to put a name in front of Outpost. Like Grace Outpost. It could have been, you know. Could have been a lot of other descriptive terms. We chose faith. So we're on the verge of, I really believe this. And thus far, our building project has not required much out of most of us. Now, there are some. Elders have been thinking and praying about this for, over a, for about a year. It was last August, literally that our elders started looking into long, longer-term plans. And then a steering committee was formed, and they did a lot of work, met a lot of hours, put in a lot of time uh, getting us to the point where we are now. And then we voted a couple of weeks ago to enter into this project. But you know what? To date, it hasn't cost you anything. Think about it. It's about to. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so my, my prayer literally has been that this would be a faith-building project for each of us individually and collectively. That God will reveal himself to you because he's done this, I, I know, for me so many times through the years financially. It's one of the ways God has worked miraculously in Terry and our life through the, through the 42 years of our marriage and just provision and his, his way of, 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 of providing for us. And we're on, we're on the verge of this. And so here's what I hope that each of us will be praying and asking. What does God want me to contribute in terms of involvement in giving? Because you know, you know this, as we grow, more of us will be called upon to serve. Some will have to stop watching the parade go by. Will we trust the Lord to raise the $30,000? Will we look at this as, that's a giant, that's too big of a goal? There's giants in the land. Will we look at it like, that's too hard, that's too much, that's too big? Or will we look at it and say, our God is faithful. Our God will lead us. Our God will enable each of us to be able to contribute and make this happen. So I think we're on the verge of a test. Then we look at the miracle in this story. Back to John chapter 6. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place. And they all sat down. And about 5,000 men were there. And Jesus took the loaves so he used that little boy's lunch. He took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish, as much as they wanted. I can just imagine, if I was there, I'd be like, can I have seconds? <laughs> hey, Peter, pass that back at our basket. All right, would you go back, Peter? And that's, this, is, this, this is what I think was happening. So Jesus is, is, is literally, he gave thanks, and he, I don't know what he's doing. He's breaking it, and he's putting it in baskets, and the, and the disciples there are each taking the baskets and giving them to a group. I think they divided people up in groups and giving them to the group leader, and, and they're dividing it amongst the crowd. I think this would have been very well organized. Can I have seconds? How about some thirds? You know, this, this is like, this just keeps happening. I'm, you know, I'm up front. I'm watching Jesus. It's just like five loaves, two fish. And it just keeps coming 
until everybody had all they wanted. And then it stopped. And then Jesus said, go pick up what's left. And there were 12 baskets. Is that coincidence? 12, how many disciples, apostles were there? Let's see, 12. You know what I think Jesus is teaching us, those who serve? There will always be enough for you. There will always be enough for you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. You know, this was the first mass miracle. <laughs> he did another one when he fed 4,000 people. But even at the, you know, John 5 at the pool of Bethesda, he didn't go in and do a mass healing. It's like one prayer, everybody, everybody in the whole hospital gets up and walks out. This is the first mass miracle. And it's... Maybe the first time Jesus included his disciples. They were the ones distributing that. So I want to talk in our remaining moments about the aftermath of this. In verses 14 and 15, it says, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and take, make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So the people wanted to come and make Jesus king by force. Uh, here's why they wanted to make Jesus king. National health care and national welfare. No political statements here, but it seems like politicians tend to promise those two things. Do they not? So they wanted Jesus as their king for those reasons. Not, well, I'll hold that for a moment. I'll go back to that idea of the prophets. Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Uh, way back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Moses, Moses, the author of Deuteronomy, Moses said, God said this to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So they had this understanding for a couple of thousand years that there would be a prophet like Moses that would arise. And Jesus was that prophet. So they, they, they weren't off base when they th were thinking this. And say, surely this is the prophet. But again, they, they stopped with Jesus as a prophet. They didn't go on and learn the true identity of Jesus. We find that out later. So it's, it's helpful to know the end of their story. So let me again, let me say this. They wanted Jesus as king of their nation, but not king of their hearts. They wanted what Jesus could do for them, not for who he was. So we read this later in John 6. This is verses 66 to 69. From this time... Many of his disciples, people that had started off, a disciple means learner, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Because they didn't like some of the things he said. It didn't fit their constructs they had in their mind. So they stopped. And Jesus asked the twelve, uh, you do not want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter spoke up, as he usually did. Sometimes he put his foot in his mouth, but sometimes he nails it. Uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You and you alone. It's kind of like Jesus, some of the times, some of the things you say, uh, I don't get But where else are we going to go? You and you alone. 
have the message of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now Jesus, the true King of all kings and Lord of all lords, laid down his life for you. For us. You know, most rulers want you to, in essence, lay down your life for them. And our country is supposed to be a country of the people, for the people, by the people. Eh, it's come, come on. Come on. I think we've maybe, not politi- I'm not trying to be political here. I'm not talking about any party here. I'm talking about hearts. Maybe. Maybe people are in it for themselves. I don't know. Jesus was in it for us. He's in it for you. He laid down his life for you. Jesus, what you'll learn is he is to be loved, worshipped, and adored above all else. He doesn't accept second place. He does not accept second place. What you'll learn is that many of the tests you face in life will be to see, to test you if you love him for who he is, not for just what he does. So I want to give you a couple of uh, keeping the conversation going questions, and then we're going to go into communion. But number one, what is your gut reaction to God testing you? What is your gut reaction? I kind of wish he'd stop, you know? Are you learning God's ways? Are you learning? And if so, how is it changing how you respond to problems and difficulties?